Hello everyone and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics and much much more. My name is Sava and today we are continuing our discussion of value at risk and various advancements that has been made to address value at risk limitations originally. Well, we have already discussed conditional value at risk and expected shortfall and how it can be approximated using averaging over smaller and smaller increments over the value at risk, but I actually kind of hinted at what we're going to do today. Value at risk is a function, necessarily, and it involves a particular distribution function, for example, a normal distribution or any other type of distribution or a historical simulation. Well, if you want to calculate conditional value at risk or expected shortfall, so the average loss that would occur in n percent of worst case scenarios, you necessarily need to compute the value of the definite integral. And most of those cumulative distribution functions can't be that easily integrated, or they can't be integrated at all even. That can be mathematically impossible, turns out. And that's exactly what the case is for the cumulative distribution function for the normal distribution that is still the most frequently used for value at risk and expected shortfall. So today I will explain how to apply the Monte Carlo simulation and the power of random numbers and convergence over long simulations to actually arrive at pretty accurate figures for conditional value at risk. Without further ado, that's our well-known study of S&P 500 five-year returns and I have carried over the calculations of VCV VAR from one of the previous videos. And uh, if we plot it uh, on a graph, we can see that dependent on the confidence interval that we're taking, like from 0.1%, that is the most extreme losses, the most extreme cutoff points that one can adopt in risk measurement, all the way to 5%, which is a more lenient cutoff point, we can see how our loss um, changes, how our value at risk changes. And uh, if we want to calculate the conditional VR, the expected shortfall, what we need to do, we would need to calculate the average loss over a particular interval from zero to our desired cutoff point. So for example, if we want to calculate the expected shortfall or conditional VR for 1%, we'll need to basically figure out what is the average value for the value at risk function from zero all the way to 1%. Geometrically, it would be the area above this curve all the way to the zero axis over here. And mathematically, that would be this definite integral that is impossible to precisely calculate or analytically derive. And here is where the Monte Carlo simulation method actually comes in handy. What we could do is we could consider a strip of the original plane, our X or Y plane, and throw a bunch of random points all over it. Then we can determine whether a point falls below the curve or above the curve. How can it help? Well, we know this function analytically, so we can figure out whether the value of x and y from this random simulation does exceed the value of the function for respective x or if it is below the curve. Then we would know how many points fall above the curve or below the curve. And if we know the ratio of the points that fall above the curve to the total amount of points, random dots, that we have thrown onto this strip of the original plane, then we can figure out the area of this segment above the graph. Also, we need to know what is the area of the original strip. And to do that, we can implement some cutoff points from, for example, minus 3%, if we believe that the losses won't exceed 3% to something like 5% or 10% or even 100%, if we are very conservative in our estimation. But that doesn't matter much. What matters is that we're going to do loads of different simulations, throw a bunch of random points on the scatter plot and see what is the proportion of the points that fall above our value graph 
and uh, the ratio of the points that do to the total number of points will inform our calculation of the conditional value at risk. That, in turn, would be informed by the geometric logic of the definite integral, as the definite integral is just the area under, and in this case, over the curve. So we're doing 10,000 simulations. First of all, we need to establish our confidence interval. Well, uh, let's just uh, set it at 1%. And the minimum, so the lowest return that it would estimate, let's say it's going to be minus 10%, just for the sake of it. So random x would be a random value of the confidence interval. In our case, it should be fluctuating between 0% and 1%. So we can apply the rand between function. And uh, well, rand between uh, only works with whole numbers. So something that we can do is we can say, uh, give us a random number between 1 and, for example, 1% from a million. And we lock this here. And then divide it by million. What it would do is it will uh, generate a whole number, an integer, within some wide bounds, and then divide it by the million. So we have a variable that fluctuates roughly between 0% and 1% with uh, sufficient variation so our simulations can work. So in that case, our random value of x is 0.43%. Uh, the random value of y needs to fluctuate from 0% to minus 10% because it's a loss. Well, we can again apply the rand between function and as our most extreme loss, let's again just put some very large number like a million times our minimum value here it's minus 10 percent so as our minimum value is fluctuating from minus 100 percent so minus one all the way to zero then we would have some scaled magnitude of loss here scaled up by a factor of million and on the right hand side let's just have zero and then divide that by one million again. So what it will give us, the random number generator will spit out a lot of various integers that will be then brought back and squished to fit our initial boundary of from minus 10% to zero, or from whatever number you input here to zero. In our case here, let's see, the dot appeared on the graph. This corresponds to the value of the loss of minus 5.95%, and the value of x 0.43%. This value, the loss of almost minus 6%, well exceeds the value at risk at 0.43%. So for the purpose of our calculations, we would consider this to fall beyond our initial graph, and we would not consider this point for the calculation of our integral or the conditional value at risk. But to verify it, we'll just need to uh, calculate the value at risk for this given confidence interval. So again, that's where the originally calculated mean and standard deviation will help. So mean plus standard deviation, and we lock the row and the column both again, and we multiply it by the standard normal inverse distribution corresponding to the probability given by this random x, this random confidence interval. And now we need to figure out whether we count this random point towards our calculation of expected shortfall or not. If the random value of y is above or equal to the corresponding value of the value at risk function, then we do count this point for our expected shortfall calculations. And so we put one. And if it falls below, then we just put zero over here. And now we can bottom like kick it all the way down and see that our scatterplot is populated by loads of points that correspond to our simulations. And some of those points are above our value graph and some of them fall below the value graph. 
So, as we noted them with zero and ones, we can actually very easily figure out this ratio by just calculating the average of this column. So the average would be twenty one point twenty four percent. But remember, that's not the value at risk per se, but the ratio between the area above the value at risk curve and the area of this strip. The area of this strip is not equal to one in that case. In that case, it's equal to minus 10%. So what we need to do is we need to multiply it by the area of the strip. So minus 10% in that case. And we get our conditional value at risk value at minus 2.16%. And if we look at what would be the average so if we were to calculate the condition of other at risk for the VCV approach, if we used averaging over small time increments, well, for example, average of that and lock the row to that with row unlocked, we can see that for 1%, the value is very close. It actually changed here to minus 2.17% because, well, remember, that's all random numbers. It can change from iteration to iteration. But see how close it is. Another useful property of the Monte Carlo simulation to calculate conditional value at risk is that we can change the confidence intervals at a blink of an eye. For example, we can input 5% over here and then it will generate a completely different um, simulation with... Uh, points scattered over a different domain, or we can actually even vary the minimum. So we can, for example, change it to minus 20%, and we see that the uh, condition of value risk does not depend much on the area of the strip that we take, um, as long as this uh, value remains reasonably low. So below, for example, 3% or 5%, something like that. Even if we take minus 100%, then the condition of value risk will still stay the same albeit our scatterplot, our chart will be much less interpretable, much less comprehensible. So like, let's stick with 10%, for example. We see that the Monte Carlo simulation um, leads to the fact that the outcomes are always slightly different, but they're never different a lot. They are relatively stable when you repeat the simulation process over a long number of iterations. And here, as we have simulated it, for 10,000 times, and here it's only a thousand dot thrown onto the scatter plot. Because if I have actually thrown all 10,000, it would be uh, incomprehensible. You couldn't even see the graph and the overall picture behind all these massive dots. If you repeat the Monte Carlo simulation for long enough, you can get a precise enough answer. For example, if we compare the 5% confidence interval conditional VAR, we can see that indeed. It's very similar to the one we got from just averaging over smaller and smaller confidence interval increments. So, what have we left with? Is Monte Carlo simulation useful? Well, it is for some purposes, for example, to calculate an integral that's impossible to figure out analytically or have a closed form solution. Uh, random numbers, especially when repeated a lot, are a powerful tool. But it shouldn't be used too much. If you have a nice way to figure something out without devoting so much computational power to it, then you probably should stick with the easier solution. Nevertheless, it's important to know what Monte Carlo simulation is and how to apply it. And that's all for today. Thank you very much and stay tuned. Please leave a like under this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I would be eager to see any suggestions for any further videos on business, economics or finance you would want me to record and share with you. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Goodbye.